I have heard it said that one of the reasons morality was important to the Christian world as it was to the Jewish world is because it was tied to the character of God. You be holy as I am holy. Whereas in the Roman world, their gods weren't really uh, 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 so demanding of such holiness or characteristics, and so their morality was derived from philosophy instead. And anything to say in that regard? I think that's a generally a fair uh, characterization. I mean, from the, from the ancient Near East onward, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the ancient um, mythologies from, from Mesopotamia, for example, um, the, the classic story of the creation of the world to switch from Rome still earlier, um, the, uh, you know, the, the gods create humans for the purpose of offering sacrifice to them so that they don't have to work. A uh, human's job is to feed the gods and sacrifice is their principal duty. And, uh, and, and so, so it's purely a cultic relationship. Gods love sacrifice. Humans offer sacrifice, and that's the way you keep gods happy, and you keep them off your back, or else you might get a special favor from them. That's pretty much, you know, it's a quid pro, quid pro quo transactional kind of relationship, by and large. Okay. Um, was the pagan practice of seeking guidance from the oracle, uh, for example, at Delphi, influential on the early church, or does it have any bearing to this issue? I don't know that it does. Um, uh, some people have drawn some analogy to, uh, a possible sort of phenomenological analogy to uh, glossolalia, tongue speaking, because it appears that the Delphic, the, the, the Delphic uh, oracle was a woman who stood over this uh, gap or a place where a, a, a f smoke or things would come up from the ground, and she would uh, go into a, a, an ecstasy and utter some kind of gibberish, and then a male priest, please note, would interpret what the woman's gibberish was. Um, I don't know that, you know, uh, it doesn't, I, I fail to see how that could, could have any great influence upon early Christianity. No. How do you understand the role of the Holy Spirit in early Christianity in the movement? Uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, everywhere. Is, uh, it's interesting, I, I did a study in one, one of the books which you may or may not have, I don't know. It's one of the better kept secrets uh, in North America right now in the book publishing industry. Um, uh, <laughs> Because the publisher has done such a lousy job, uh, I won't I won't mention it. But Abington Press is a press I would <laughs> I would never work with again. Uh, but I did a little book called uh, God in New Testament Theology. It's an excellent book. Unfortunately, not too many people know about it. Um, and uh, one of the things that I did in looking through that was was to go looking for biblical material. By my count, the Holy Spirit is referred to about 25 times in the Old Testament and yet a few hundred times in the New Testament. It's, it's so, so, so references to the Holy Spirit explode in the discourse of early Christianity, and, is, and the Holy Spirit functions in early Christian thought as the typical mode or medium through which God communicates Himself to us and imparts Himself to us, actually. That's the splendid thing. And also the standard sort of mode or medium through which Christians in turn um, worship God, offer their worship to God. So, central. Interesting thing, though, early Christian discourse about God is triadic-shaped with references to God the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit, ubiquitous. But early Christian devotional practice is dyadic in shape, with prayers and devotion addressed to God and to Christ. The Spirit doesn't function as a, as a stated recipient of devotion in the New Testament or in early Christianity. It isn't until the fourth century when a Christian council has to debate the question, should we worship the Spirit? They finally decide yes, but isn't it interesting? It's in the fourth century before the question even comes up. Okay. Well after Augustine, the Council of Toledo did not forbid young Christian men from having concubines. So how common was male chastity? Um, I'm talking, first thing I have to say is, I, I will plead, I'm talking about Christianity in the first three centuries when it was much more, um, I would say, uh, ethically virile than it was in later centuries. Um, after Constantine, uh, things become much more complicated. And so to talk, to talk of what Christian councils did or did not do in the eighth century is, first of all, a period about which I'm almost entirely ignorant, uh, but not really relevant to the book, which is about early, Christ, uh, the period in which in the words of one scholar, early Christians had to live by their wits. 
How do the earliest of Christian manuscripts draw distinctions between philosophy, religion, and praxis? Um, I'm not sure what is meant there, um, but uh, early Christians, uh, early Christian manuscripts rarely, well, of course, they, they don't refer to religion as we know it because they say there's no such entity. Um, uh, there is a great deal of emphasis on, uh, on, the, on the early Christian praxis on behavior. Um, philosophy doesn't get too high a, a, a reference, I mean, as, as far as uh, Christians are concerned. Um, All right, great question. Did sin exist in the Roman pagan world? You could offend the gods. They don't use the word sin, but you could offend the gods uh, and incur their wrath or their punishment, particularly through uh, failing in some kind of cultic, to, failing to offer some kind of a proper cultic thing or, or violating some of their rules. Um, uh, Musonius also says that, it's interesting, Musonius and some of the Stoic philosophers also say that, uh, that to abandon your children, to expose your children, is one of the things that Musonius was against as well that infant infanticide, uh, d discarding your children, was offensive to Zeus, he says. And so some of the Stoic philosophers did ascribe to some of the gods a, a certain moral quality, but as they say, as, as a social project, these philosophical circles are quite limited in their impact. That's where the difference is. When did Nominus Sacre Reform stop? This writer says, I noticed they were used in Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and uh, might they have been in the original autographs? Uh, exciting possibility. I, I don't think they were in the original autographs. I, I wrote an article uh, published back in 1999, I think, in which I developed a proposal uh, for how the Nomina Sacra may have originated in the Journal of Biblical Literature, and so I'll uh, refer people to that. Uh, my proposal in brief is that I think it probably began in a bilingual setting, a, a, uh, a setting in which uh, members of the Jesus movement uh, spoke and could, uh, could, could function both in Greek and in Hebrew or Aramaic. And, uh, uh, and that the earliest Nomen Sacrum form was probably a Nomen Sacrum form of Jesus, but not the form that you uh, customarily see, not the first letter, last letter form, but another form of abbreviation of Jesus' name, which is exclusive to the name of Jesus, and that is the first two letters, Yoda Eta. Uh, and that's a form that we see only in early manuscripts, and it dies out and is superseded by this other form. So uh, I don't think it was in the original mon autographs, but I think it must have originated early. And along with Colin Roberts, I would suspect that it may well have originated in the late first century sometime. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not an idiot, so I'm not going to argue with you. Okay. okay? <laughs> but I'm going to throw an idea out there for you to discuss for a moment. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of Judaism, of course, they would avoid, even at the time of Jesus, writing the Tetragrammaton. And, and we see in the, the facsimile copies, uh, they would either use four ellipses or they would uh, use some other nomina sacra for God, I sometimes write it in Paleo-Hebrew script instead of in the Aramaic script. The early church is Jewish. Some of the early scriptures, certainly Paul, Jewish. Is it beyond cavil that he might... Uh, uh, use some type of an abbreviation. Even a lot of Jews today will write God, G-D. Um, is it beyond, uh, uh, I mean, you got any room in there for that? Um, <laughs> the, 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 the Jewish reverential practices that you talk about uh, tend to involve substitution of uh, the word, for example, the word Elohim for yod heh or use of substituting dots, or as you say, writing in a Hebrew copy where the, where the divine name appears, that w Hebrew copy in the kind of Hebrew that you see here that we know about, writing the name of God in Paleo-Hebrew characters, or in Greek manuscripts, interestingly, uh, writing the name of God in Hebrew characters. So it'll be Greek, 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 and wherever uh, Yahweh's name appears, it will be written. So it's substitutes, it's not abbreviations, the mechanics are different. Uh, secondly, uh, it, and, and very importantly, uh, those substitutions were intended, it appears, to guide how you were to read the text aloud. So when you get to that tetragram, uh, the fact that it was written in a different script was to signal to you, you don't pronounce it. You would use an oral substitute, which in Hebrew would probably be Adonai, and in uh, Greek uh, would be Kyrios, according to the earliest uh, references that we have from Philo and Josephus and so on. So it was, uh, it was intended as a reader's aid to cue you that when you get to that point, you pronounce something different than you, know, you don't pronounce the divine name. It's okay to write it, but you shouldn't pronounce it. 
Early Christian nominus sacra practice, as far as we know, made no difference to the way the words were vocalized. So when you got to the nomen sacrum form, Yoda Sigma, you said Jesus. Uh, so it seems to have been purely a visual phenomenon, not something intended to shape how you read the text. Well, while we're on that tub subject, when we see Jesus being referred to as the Lord, Hokurios, in the New Testament, should we understand that to be meaning Jesus is identified as uh, yod heh vav -He, as Trinitarians believe, or simply Master, as Unitarians believe? Uh, it depends on the context. There are passages in which uh, the, t the term kurios in Greek and uh, the term adon in Hebrew have a wide, uh, as the term Lord does, for example, if you uh, proceed to trial, as you may know, uh, in, a, in a British court, you would probably address the judge as my Lord, not your honor. Uh, and of course, we have lords aplenty, a whole house of lords uh, in the British Parliament. Uh, so the term Lord can, can mean a variety of things, and, and as it can in Greek. So you have to look at the level of sentences. There are sentences in the New Testament, I think, when, uh, where Jesus is referred to as, uh, you know, as, as the Lord teaches and so on. So may well mean simply the Master. But there are important passages, identified in particular by my friend who's here tonight, David Capes, where Old Testament passages that uh, un, um, unarguably refer to God, uh, yod heh vav -Heh, uh, are applied to Jesus. A classic one, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That is, of course, a phrasing that is lifted from the Old Testament, whosoever calls upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved but in the New Testament uh, amended to be a cultic invocation of Jesus by name. So certainly in early Christian devotional practice, which is what I've dined out on for quite a lot for the last 25 years, early Christian devotional practice, Jesus functions in a way that is very similar to the way in which God functions in devotional practice. Did early Christians participate in Roman military service? Did they fight wars? Yes, uh, at, at some point uh, we know that there are Christian um, soldiers because, of course, there are, uh, there are examples of Christian soldiers who identify themselves as Christians and, and in some cases are martyred. Um, there are, the early, early, early Christianity in the pre-Constantinian period seems to, have been, seems to have differed over this. You have some people who are saying that you can't be a soldier, it's, uh, it's, it's incompatible. Of course, the reason for it is not simply because you're participating in, you may have to participate in violence, but also because all of the Roman legions had their own tutelary deities, which were represented in uh, standards that were borne by the troops, and the troops were expected to engage in cultic devotion and sacrifices to those gods, those standards, to protect them in battle. And so it would be difficult for a Christian to participate in that. So um, we don't know what the Christian soldiers did under those occasions. Did they sort of, you know, look at their shoes while this was going on, or, um, uh, or, or something? We don't know. Um, uh, various devices had to be formed. So we know that there were Christian soldiers from at least the second century and perhaps even earlier, but there were other Christians who said it was wrong for people to be soldiers. Praetorian Guard, yeah. Philippians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was the early Christian practice of meeting regularly on the first day of the week distinct? Did Roman pagan practice have something similar? No. Um, the, um, the practice of a weekly gathering, by the way, uh, seems to have been uh, 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 originally a Jewish practice of meeting on Sabbath and Sabbath observance seems to have been one of the identifiably ethnic, uh, eth ethnic peculiarities of the Jews, which pagan writers often co uh, comment about and accuse the Jews of laziness, that they, 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 they don't want to work properly, which is seven days a week or whatever. Uh, and so the, the weekly day of rest was seen as, by some pagan critics as a weekly day of laziness. Um, but, uh, and then early Christianity adopts that practice. Of course, the earliest Christians, being Jews, would have met and worshipped uh, with Jews on the Sabbath, and it appears then met in the name of Christ on the first day of the week, uh, the Sunday. Uh, and, and so the, the practice of a weekly, regular cultic gathering seems to have derived from Judaism and been distinctively Jewish and Christian. The distinctive nature of Judaism and the associated conflict with the wider Roman culture generated several attempts to bridge the differences. This writer cites uh, the Jewish Antiquities by Josephus as an example. Should we read Luke Acts in light of Christian distinctives with Roman ideas and culture in the same way, having an apologetic force to address some, all, or a few of these Roman concerns? Probably. Uh, Luke Acts, uh, you, you may know, is, it, is addressed to a, 
uh, most excellent Theophilus, and the adjective there, most excellent, is commonly used to, uh, as, a, as a, a respectful form of address to somebody who is in um, uh, official status or official authoritative status. And so it may well be a person who was a magistrate or somebody in, in high status. Uh, and uh, the other thing, of course, is that Luke, acts, uh, Luke and Acts individually um, and together comprise some of our um, most impressive uh, literary works. I mean, Luke and Acts, by the way, comprises about 25% of the entire New Testament, so it's quite a, quite a sizable uh, literary effort involved. Um, and uh, so it, it, it does, uh, particularly Acts, does address, of course, the encounter of Christians with Roman authorities and magistrates, and more often than not, portrays them as um, either tolerating Christians or, or not, in, you know, not, be, not engaged in, in persecuting them so much. Uh, so some people have suggested that, that, um, that one of the purposes of Acts was to serve as a kind of early the term is apologia, or defense of Christianity, uh, to the to Roman authority, saying, "We're not bad people. Leave us alone." Which which other Christians subsequently tried to argue as well. Uh, concerning religious identity and ethnic identity, you talked about how the two were distinct within the Christian world. Does this play into or derive from the decisions at the First Council of Jerusalem? I guess Acts 15 where Gentile converts were not required to join in following all the law or become Jewish. In effect, did the Acts, J Jerusalem Council and Acts 15 decision render Gentile converts stateless, neither Jewish nor fully Roman, neither, neither Jew nor Greek? No. Uh, <laughs> um, and as we continue the lightning two, round... Uh, two, two things. One is, of course, that the the uh, insistence that uh, pagans who become uh, members of the Jesus movement must not become Jews, must not change their ethnicity, seems to go back to the earliest moments of Paul's mission to the Gentiles. He insists on principle that pagan converts must remain, or as Jews would call them, uh, Gentiles, must remain Gentile people and not become proselyte to Judaism in order to fulfill the biblical prophecies, it appears, such as Isaiah, which talk about the nations of the world shall come to Jerusalem. It doesn't say they become Jews. It says the nations come and worship the God of Israel as the nations. So Paul insists upon that. The issue with the Jerusalem Council is there are certain people who were challenging that, and the decision is whether Paul has been correct in doing that or not. And the Jerusalem Council essentially ratifies a form of that. Okay. In the early first century, were the very early Christian writings considered the literal word of God? If so, did this mean they were unique in that regard? I don't know that there's evidence of, um, uh, of, of the writings, authors of the writings making that claim for themselves. Uh, they, they don't, you know, early, uh, early Christian writers don't say, this is Holy Scripture and by George you better uh, read it as such. Instead, they were written for edification, uh, you know, as, as John says, this has been written that you might believe and that believing you may have life in his name. So they certainly were intended for promoting the Christian faith, for teaching people how to behave and so on. Um, and, and they acquire the status of Scripture uh, at some point in the late first century and progressively thereafter. Although it's very interesting, um, if you read something like 1 Corinthians 14, is it? Uh, somewhere there after he's been giving instructions about worship, he says, uh, uh, and if anyone uh, who does not t consider what I treat here as authoritative, he is not to be considered. You know, so it, it looks as though, the, the, so, so initially what you have though is not the authority of the text, but the authority of the apostolic figure who writes the text. And, uh, and, and that is a contributing factor probably to the emergence of Paul's writings being treated as scripture. Okay, there are some really good questions here that we did not have time to ask, but I'm sure they're in his books, so go buy his books. <laughs> well, yeah, probably have to buy them all because they're some, uh, somewhere, you know. Yeah, yeah, no telling which one it's in, but it's in one of them, I'm sure. Would you join me in thanking uh, Larry Hurtado?